Thanks for joining me today. We're going to talk about some anesthetic considerations for pacemakers. This is going to go into a moderate area of coverage for what we need to know for the OR. However, we could definitely go in more depth if we had more time. Before we go into detail and we talk about how pacemakers work, let's first understand Ohm's law since it's relevant to pacemakers. Electrons or electricity is always in a potential. Electrons won't go anywhere unless they have a, a source to go to. So a ground, uh, some type of source back. Uh, in this case, a grounding pad would be a great example. And with the unipolar bovies and the ORs, bipolar, there's a place for the electrons, I guess, to return home is a way to think about it. In, in this case, uh, when we're thinking of electrons and current, uh, there's a graph here that's helping us understand it when we're using water. So there's a potential here, and that potential is measured in volts. And the amount of volts depends on the height of the water in this case. So you'd have a higher pressure the higher that column water goes up, or the hydrostatic pressure. Again, we're just loosely trying to compare this with electrical potential. So there's, there's equal potential in both of these containers on both sides because the water is at the same level on both sides. Um, this is similar in, in terms of pressure when you look at how cities or smaller suburban areas get their waters in their faucets or city water. There's usually a big tank that's up on a hill that's far away or up on a massive platform that's high up in the air so that there's always potential for pressure of water when you open up your faucet. It's not depending on a pump to continuously provide water to the entire city population. We would never be able to do that. Uh, instead, the cities will usually pump water in to maintain that level of water at a high height under pressure, gravity, however you want to look at it. And so there's this potential that's there. But you don't get water in your sink until you open up the faucet. Now, how much water you get, or in terms of when we look at this chart, I, current, will depend greatly on the resistance of that water coming from, let's say, the water tower. And these could be our two water towers on the, on the actual picture here. So if you have less resistance, in this case, this pipe, its diameter is much larger on the left than the right. So there's less resistance on the left compared to the right. So the left's resistance is one versus the right is two. And so if there's less resistance, or as we know in flow and Pascal's law, an increased radius, we'll get more flow. And in this case, we'll get more current. And so we can measure uh, the pressure and the flow here at the end or at the end of this, let's say this large water container. If we're if we have a scenario on the right side where we have increased resistance, we can still get the same amount of electrons. But in order to do that, we would want this column water to be higher. So we want that potential to be higher. So we'd want to have something that's more than one volt in potential on the right side to, to accommodate the fact that we have higher resistance. And our current, as far as measuring the current, Current is going to be the number of electrons delivered. In the case of pacemakers, that's going to be a milliamps that's delivered per second. So on the EKG tracing, or at least on a 12 EKG tracings, where we can actually see small and big boxes, not only are we measuring on the x-axis seconds, but on the y-axis we can measure either height to middle millimeters or also we can measure the actual amplitude in millivolts of the various complexes we can measure the p wave in height and then the r wave in height we ignore both basically the t wave the two biggest things that we're concerned with is identifying and distinguishing a p wave from an r wave and then not sensing a t wave for something that's an r wave or a p wave because again we don't want to send an, uh, a pace uh, spike on a R wave, on a T wave. And so again, we're, we have to somehow, the pacemaker has to somehow distinguish between all these things so that it appropriately synchronizes, if possible, in the best case scenario, the atrial contractions with the ventricle contractions. And then in disease states, ignore one or the other, depending on if it's helpful or not. So if someone had 
atrial fibrillation, the 350s, um, you're going to ignore that and you're only going to want that ventricle pacing at a normal rate of 60 to 100. You would not want to be pacing and matching that atrial rate if it's abnormal and vice versa. If there's an AV node that's disease, but you have good uh, good conduction systems in the atrium and the ventricle, is there a mode that can pace both? And yes, there is. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the lecture. Uh, 1,000 milliseconds equal one second, as you see at the top here. Uh, just try and make out the little things that, you know, big box is 0.2 seconds, and there's five little boxes. Little boxes are 0.04 seconds in the middle. That's how we calculate the PR intervals to QRS widths and stuff, is trying to distinguish between, you know, first degree secondary blocks, or we're trying to distinguish, you know, a bundle branch block and then QT syndrome prolongation and so on. So what's a pacemaker for? Well, what can a pacemaker do? Can it increase the heart? Can it decrease the heart? And really, all it can do is increase the heart. And it can provide a source of action potential, a store of an action potential that hopefully causes synchronous change and depolarization across the heart in areas that have no heart rate, or it can speed up a heart in cases where the heart rate's not enough and we want to pace at higher rates, but a pacemaker cannot slow the heart down. It does not inhibit the heart. The only thing it can inhibit is itself. So it can pace, it can also sense, and if it thinks that the rhythm that's going on currently is good, it can inhibit itself, which means if it has a lead, a, a pacing lead in the atrium or ventricle or both, it won't do anything. Even though it can, it has the potential to pace depending on where the leads are, atrium, ventricles, both, maybe both ventricles, but it can decide based on the criteria you tell it that it might not want to do anything if the heart's doing its job on its own. Why work if the heart is doing an okay job? The battery is going to last longer, obviously, and the heart most likely is going to pace a lot more efficiently than the pacemaker is. So we can pace the heart in a couple different ways. Most of us are familiar with the big pads that come with the defibrillators. We can pace through the defibrillator if it has the function. It, the defibrillator pads are for defibrillation when you have someone that goes into cardiac arrest. So you see someone that falls at a public space, someone brings over an automated you know, external defibrillator. That's not going to have, most likely, functions to pace someone's heart. It's just there for shock rhythms. And if you go back to BLS and ACLS and PALS, there's two shock rhythms, which is VFib and VTAC, but pulseless VTAC. Some people can be alive and talking to you with VTAC, but their tachycardia is not that fast that they actually have a, a pulse. They actually are producing enough blood that they are awake. But the one, the conditions where someone is unconscious, no pulse, and technically dead would be VTAC and VFib without a pulse. So you can see the rhythm of the monitor, and that's the rhythm you're seeing, but when you feel a pulse in their radial or their carotid or their or femorals, there's no pulse. If you have no pulse, you're definitely not awake. So we're used to those pads. It seems that most people prefer, and the best chance for good conduction is between a pad you have to have a source, right? You have to have a place to ground out to. So one pad and then another pad on the, on the back, or you can go top of the right of the chest to the bottom left axillary, um, but you have to have a, a connection. And so typically the AP is the best, which is, you know, front of the chest over the heart and then the back of the chest, like right below or to the right of the uh, scapula. The second thing we can do is we can just, you know, pace with a pacemaker. So these implanted pacemakers can be fully controlled through their consoles, their connection consoles that are provided by the manufacturer, whether it's Medtronic or Boston Scientific, you can do a lot of things controlling the thresholds, the sensitivities, the, the modulations that those can do, which are much more advanced than what we physically control in the operating rooms. Uh, but you can do all that actually with the pacemaker, but just know that as you mess around with the pacemaker function, or in this case, if you were to try and shock someone out of arrhythmia with the pacemaker, which if it's an ICD, you can do that, but it's going to take down that battery life a little bit. So yeah, if it's possible in some situations, people still prefer to use the pads versus using the pacemaker. I think it's all going to depend on what the cardiologist wants to do. 
Okay, so heart surgery isn't where you see a ton of pacemaker use. It's hopefully going to be temporary and people are going to be able to come off of it. They'll wean them onto on-off drips and on-off pacing, and then hopefully the heart just isn't so stunned anymore and it recovers. But after you have cardiac surgery, it is not uncommon for you to have possibly uh, two different sets of leads of wires coming out uh, that are attached to your heart during the surgery, and they're going to go to your the atrial part of your heart and the ventricle part, and they're going to get tunneled through your skin, and as they close your chest and stuff, you'll just be out in the recovery room with you know, two sets of wires just sticking out. And so it's an easy place to access your heart and to be able to pace your heart because your heart might be stunned. It might need a little bit of extra help. And it's a very low resistance now because you're going through actual wires directly to the myocardial tissue where you can produce your own action potentials and depolarizations and hopefully cause the heart to be according to whatever you're deciding. So you want to beat the atrium, do you want to beat the ventricles, do you want to do it synchronously, do you want to do just one? Do you want to sense the atrium and then pace the ventricles if they're not responding well? Or do you want to ignore the atrium but pace just the ventricles and vice versa? Uh, so they're great and they're temporary and they usually then, you know, basically get pulled out uh, and hopefully don't cause bleeding. The other way we can pace someone is with transvenous pacing. So the everything, so the option on the left, pacer pads, and the option on the right with transvenous pacemakers are probably your two big options for emergency pacing. Uh, both can be done on the portable uh, defibrillator machines, the more advanced portable portable defibrillator machines that paramedics have and the hospitals have. Uh, so, you know, pacer pads are a little bit more straightforward. You just throw them on, turn up the juice, and hopefully start to get capture and and or sense it, you know, sense what they have for an really beat. But in most cases, you're just going to override the intrinsic rhythm and try and just, you know, raise someone's heart rate to a reasonable amount because you're talking, you know, the person has no cardiac output, most likely is symptomatic, blood pressure is less than 90, maps are less than 60. A uh, transient pace is going to take probably 20 minutes. It's a several steps. You're going to put in uh, central access, and you got to done up, get sterile, find all the equipment. So it's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, the next thing just to think about as you're looking at these four options is if there's less resistance than the actual the actual amount of millivolts or actual amount of volts that you're going to need to send will go down because you don't have as much resistance so the heart still needs a certain amount of current at the right cycles in order for the pacing to work or in case of shocking to shocking to work but it the resistance is different between let's say those pads and then the wires that are directly on the epicardium or you know i'm not sure the differences between the endocardium and epicardium you know, but again, the resistance might be different, so you have to adjust accordingly. So you have a patient that has a, an obvious bump on their left chest. It can also be on their right chest too. Not everyone's pacemakers are on the left. It could be a lot of different places. There'll be a temporary pacemaker in someone's neck even. So you gotta, you gotta ask the patient, you know, have they ever had any type of cardiac procedure? And if they have unknown areas or questionable areas, ask them what it is. What kind of device is that? Is it a brain simulator or is it a pacemaker? Uh, both have great implications for anesthesia, but as far as the heart's concerned, uh, a lot of implications if we're going to be doing any type of cartery or bovang and stuff later on, where if they're pacemaker dependent, uh, you need to know that. So it's important to know the brain device, the model, how long has it been in, what's its battery life and stuff. What uh, happens if you put a magnet on it because you're afraid of interference from what the surgeon's doing? Uh, you can x-ray these things. So if the person doesn't know and they don't have their card, which is what we're seeing here, most people have a card. You can ask them, hey, do you, have a, do you have a card in your wallet? Would you mind letting us see what that is? And then you can just call Boston Scientific or just call Medtronic and, and find out exactly what they have, when it was interrogated last. Uh, and you know what? To be honest, uh, Medtronic, I think it is actually now, you know, getting units out to hospitals that basically is a station that can interpret the pacemaker with little to no interference with yourself. And you can talk to the reps or the specialists, the engineers, and they're going to go through the, they're going to pretty much 
use that station remotely to access the device and change things and then change it back after the case. So it seems silly enough to do your due diligence and actually check these pacemakers, make sure that they're working correctly before you even go back to the OR. And then in this case, if the engineers can actually, if you had to, depending on what your needs are, had to deactivate the tachyarrhythmias and stuff and the therapies with an ICD, for instance, where, hey, if it senses what the surgeon's doing and thinks it's VTAC, it's gonna shock them in the middle of the case, it's gonna deplete the battery, it might hurt the patient, probably hurts the patient, but maybe the patient's asleep, but still, maybe it wakes them up because it makes their anesthetic levels go up because they're getting shocked, what have you, they may actually disable it and you don't ever have to put a, a magnet on it and not know what that magnet's gonna do. But again, if you're interrogating, you might know what the magnet's gonna do, uh, and you might just wanna do that because then it's more guaranteed that when you take it off, hopefully it goes back to its normal setting. So again, maybe you know you could put the magnet on, but then have it get have the device interrogate it after. Either way, if you put a magnet on something, you need to know what it's gonna do. You need to know what it is the person has. And you need to know too that whatever the person has is working. A, is the machine working? What's the battery life? But also an x-ray is not bad because it's gonna tell you if the leads are okay as well. Because you could have damaged leads. Damaged connection to leads to the actual patient. Maybe something got broken because of patient's manipulation, trauma, something under the clavicle. Maybe the device was tied down too tightly over time. Things can change. So we talked about x-rays. So an x-ray tells you a lot of information. Sometimes you can read information about the device directly on the x-ray, but the x-ray will show you how many leads it has, and then it'll show you where the leads terminate. And if you're really good at reading the x-ray, you can, you can see when the leads are in the right place. So you can see a lead that's coiled up in the wrong place. Maybe it's stuck in the sphere of cava or came out completely. Um, you can see a lead that's no longer in the coronary sinus, for instance. Uh, so these are all important things. This picture is now outlined. Someone drew in basically the right ventricle, the left ventricle. The left ventricle sits more posterior, so it's more behind the right ventricle, but you see some parts of it here. And then the left ventricle typically goes, I would say a little bit more caudal. Um, this left ventricle appears to be more left sort of access. But uh, you see this pacemaker has two leads coming out. and we can kind of see where one's going and the second one is a little hard to see. So let's go to the, our examples and we'll start talking about uh, these things. Remember, you know, an x-ray can take less than five minutes to determine everything. If they have a card, you can call and figure it out as well. We're, we're not talking a lot of time here, but you feel, you're gonna feel much more reassured that you determined what you were working with versus if something goes wrong or if you depend on that pacemaker working in the PACU when they have a tachyrhythmia, it doesn't work, you're not going to get sued because you didn't, you didn't interpret it or interrogate it and figure out that, hey, it wasn't working to begin with. And then you said, I'm not going to do the case. Let's get this fixed. Or in the case of you took the magnet off and then go back to the settings you had thought it would. Okay. So let's start with the left. We see a pacemaker. Uh, it actually looks kind of low on the patient. But we have a pacemaker, not probably where you would expect compared to the picture on the right. It's probably where you would expect the left upper chest, sort of like under the clavicle. But we have a pacemaker on the left. We have wires that kind of go up uh, through the superior, um, through the um, left brachial or left subclavian um, vein, and now they go into the left or the right atrium, and then they have one that's now going somewhere else. There's two wires, so the most likely place it's going then is it's a dual pacing generator so you have right atrium you have right ventricle and these are these are screwed in or they're they bite onto the endocardial endocardium so onto the actual wall of the heart and stuff and then they get implanted there and they get scar tissue tissue gets forms over them and really holds them in place and stuff so they do move as the heart contracts but the actual lead shouldn't move that much away from the heart and stuff once it's been uh, sealed or screwed into place and stuff. So we see it's a right atrium and it's a 
right ventricle. So now the picture on the right, we see what appears to actually be two different leads again, but we see that one is actually going up and then over. And so this one, so the one that actually has the arrow versus the arrow head, the arrow head is the right ventricle. And now the arrow on the one that's sort of on the right picture, but on the right upper, like right on the top right, I guess, that's actually going through the coronary sinus and going towards the left ventricle. So you can access the coronary sinus, it dumps into the right ventricle, and you can go through it with the catheter, and the EP surgeon will do this, and it can terminate in the left, over the left ventricle. So it doesn't actually go into the left ventricle, but it's, you know, over it. And as a result, you can pace left ventricle. Now, why do you think this is important? And you're going to see this all the time with these patients in the uh, operating rooms, is people need to go back for dual, dual ventricle synchronized pacemaking. And the key word there, synchronize. You can lose about 10 to 15 percent of the efficiency of the heart when you're pacing from the right side because what you're depending on now is the starch depolarization of the right heart and then you know through the symptom of the heart you will get a action potential that's going to carry through all that tissue but it's going to go from right to left versus the normal conduction systems down the Purkinje fibers which is down the middle and you get basically a synchronized single concentric type of contraction all at once on both ventricles. But now if you start from the right, you're going to have a delay on the far left lateral wall of the heart, and that septum is going to contract before that left lateral wall contracts, and that slight delay is going to cause dyssynchrony between the two ventricles and make the actual cardiac output not as efficient or as good. So patients who typically need this done are patients who are now in heart failure but are resistant to medicine. Okay, so we have, we'll start with the picture on the left. So the picture on the left, we notice that there's only one lead that's coming out. We notice that there is a thicker part right here and a thicker part right here. So I think this is sort of like a, a sizzler at one of the, or sparkler, I'm sorry, sparkler at one of the 4th of July parties. You have a little stick with a bigger part on it, and that bigger part's what, like, gives off that bright, that bright flash, those sort of that energy. And so in this case, this is a, this is an ICD. So you have an ICD here that, you know, again, is going to shock the heart if there's tachyarrhythmias. And we know that in order for electrons to flow somewhere, they always have potential, but they need to have a path home. And so the path home is going to be, uh, it's going to go from point A to point B. So you're going to have one path going to here and then to here, and then comes back up and travels back to the pacemaker. Um, so you're able, able to successfully defibrillate the heart in a similar fashion if you had the pads right here and then down here. Um, again, you could also have pads that are AP, one here, and then behind the, the back, the one behind the back and stuff. But this is a defibrillator or an, uh, an ICD, uh, so you're able to shock the heart. You've got the upper one is probably in the spirit vena cava, and this one's in the right ventricle. So on the right now, we can see that this one actually has two leads. You know, leads look like they're intact, nothing looks fractured, you're in the right spot on the top right here. And we notice though that this has the same thick sparkler type looking uh, consistency to it. So it's a thicker part and again, it looks like it's in the superior vena cava and the right ventricle. So what do you think that is? Well, it looks like this is at least an ICD, and maybe it's also a pacemaker. So where does the other lead terminate? And we actually see it terminate where the arrowhead is. So the other lead terminates, and I can draw the lead. That's the other lead. So it goes like this. So this can pace the right atrium and the right ventricle. So it's a ICD and a dual chamber pacemaker. 
Okay, let's set this up a little bit further. So on the t on the left here, we actually see three different things coming out, three different lines coming out. One, two, and three coming out of this generator, of some kind of generator. So the first thing I probably assume, you know, when you have uh, three definitely, you probably, and we can confirm it, we see that this is definitely an ICD. There's that thick line right here. And down here, it looks like that's the other part of the thick line. So this first arrow right here is going to tell you that, again, we just sort of identified it. It's a ICD, and it has the one branch in the SVC-ish area here, and the other one in the right ventricle. So that gives us an idea where the right ventricle is. So probably this is like the right, you know, this might be like the right ventricle right here. It's kind of hard to see, but again, so where's the other lines? Well, let's find the obvious one where you have another arrow head, which is right here. So this is going to be your right atrium. And that leaves us with one other possibility is if your atrium and red ventricle are taken care of because of one, because of the ICD and then the right atrium pacer, the only other place that you'd want to be pacing is the left ventricle. So this is in the left ventricle through the coronary sinus, most likely. So now we have on the right picture, we have a another generator. We have one lead, and it looks like it goes all the way into the right ventricle. It's not a generator, but we see an arrow up here. And so what we're wondering is, is what are they trying to point to? And we see is, is we see that this is fractured. So this lead is fractured. It is not going to pace the heart. So if someone comes in bradycardic in the 40s and they're like, well, I got this pacemaker. I don't understand why I feel so terrible and so tired right now. Well, it might be because the person's lead is fractured in this case. So what can we do if we had a device that we could set different things? Well, on that device, we're going to be able to set the rate, the sensitivity for determining, hey, is that an R wave? Or do we even care about looking at it? Is that a P wave? Do we even care about looking at it? So is that R wave for ventricles responding or not responding? And is that a P wave and should we care about it, which is the atrium? We can also set the threshold or the output. So we can decide how much volts we're gonna send to the heart to tell it what to do. Different heart tissue needs different amount of volts in order to tell it what to do. There's different impedances and resistances based on if you're using pads or if you're using epicardial wires or endocardial wires and if it's scar tissues there and whatever else. People have different types of impedances and resistance. The other thing we can say is the mode. So we can decide do we want to pace both the atrium and the ventricles or just the ventricles or just the atriums. Uh, and then also we can man manipulate the way that the actual pacemaker responds to dynamic changes in demand, which is not something we're going to really ever do, but that's something that some of these pacemakers can do. But for us, it's basically rate, mode, sensitivity, and threshold. So when you look at the pacemaker uh, and it's written, it usually shows you three to five letters. It's the first three letters that we're most concerned with. So letter one is what it paces. It's the most important part of the pacemaker. Therefore, it's the first letter. What does it pace? In this case, it can either pace the ventricle, the atrium, or both. And when it, both, when it, when it does both, it's going to show up as a letter D for both. It's dual. Next is, what does it care about? I mean, we don't want to put a pacemaker in that just does one thing. It just paces and it doesn't care about anything else because what can happen is you get RNT syndrome or you can just make someone's heart like not work right. If someone's heart is beating at 60 beats a minute or at least the electric the potentials are going that fast and then we're beating at 60 a minute, well, their rate could effectively be 120 depending on the relative refractory of the person's heart and the different 
uh, different parts of the heart that have their own automaticity. So sense is the second one. And then the third one is, is what do you do in response to sensing something? If I see that someone has a P wave, do I necessarily need to pace the ventricles? Well, if they have a normal conduction system and the P wave gets through the AV node and the AV node goes through the brick energy fibers and both ventricles pace naturally to the atrial depolarization, well, you don't need to do anything. The pacemaker can just hang out. You know, it can just say, I'm gonna wait. Like, things are good right now. I'm gonna wait until I'm needed and stuff, until they call in the reinforcements. So what it does is important. So it can do nothing, which is O, or it can inhibit, which means a pacemaker, you can only inhibit one thing with a pacemaker. Pacemakers only pace. So if you inhibit the pacemaker, it means it's not gonna pace. It doesn't tell the heart to slow down. All it can do is pace. So if you inhibit the pacemaker, it just doesn't pace. And what doesn't that pace? It doesn't pace what the first letter is. So if it's got a wire in the ventricle, it won't pace the ventricle. If it's got a wire in both the atrium and the ventricles, well, guess what? It might not pace the ventricle, but it might pace the atrium. So now it depends on what it says is what the lettering is in the third, the third column. So it can be it can inhibit the V, it can inhibit the atrial lead, or it can inhibit both. Again, both being D. Both is always D for dual. Okay, so we can talk about sensitivity. So how does it know when it needs to pace? Well, it needs to make sure that there's no underlying electrical activity that's actually working well for the patient because it doesn't want to pace when someone doesn't need the pace. No one wants to get shocked when they don't need to get shocked. So threshold is, or the sensitivity is trying to find the threshold, which is that the point at which it can pick up the appropriate wave. We only look at two things, atrium, which correlates to the P wave, and we look at the ventricles, which is correlating to the R wave. So let me do the only thing we're looking at. So let's just assume all we care about right now is we have to figure out, hey, are the ventricles working? All we care about the ventricles, screw the atrium, screw atrial kick, which we know is gonna contribute 20, 30% of cardiac output, but let's just pretend it doesn't matter right now. All we care about is the ventricles. We wanna feel pulse with our fingers in the radial artery, at least 60 to 100 a minute. So first things first is we don't wanna pace this person if they're beating 60 to 100 and we're happy with their cardiac output. They seem like they have great perfusion to their entire body. So we'll look at the uh, ability of the pacer to signal that it's sensing the right waveform. And so we know looking at this graph that the R wave is always gonna be higher than the P wave uh, and hopefully always higher than the T wave unless we have peak T waves, which could actually throw this whole thing off. So basically, we want to start our sensitivity off and work our way to the point where we hit the threshold of the R wave. And so when I say that is, is we want to start and figure out where our sensitivity is when we hit this point right here. So if we had to guess that sensitivity, based on what this chart's saying, again, this could be different for everyone. Let's just say that that's 10. If we figure out that at, at 10, we're able to pick up on the R wave, the next step is to figure out, well, what should we do for redundancy so the machine always picks up that 10, or always picks up that R wave, always knows what the R wave is. And the answer is, is typically, once you find the sensitivity and you lower your setting down, you lower your sanity down, you should divide that number. So in this case, we're gonna say this is 10 and divide it by two, which means we should set our sensitivity at half of what the actual threshold is, which is this is threshold, the point that we actually figured out where we were. And the next question is, if you understand what we're talking about is, do you make the device more sensitive or less sensitive? And then physically on the machine, does that mean you make the number higher or lower to make it either more sensitive or less sensitive? So in this case, 
if you're not sensing the R wave, you have to make it more sensitive. In order to make it more sensitive, you have to lower, again, we have to lower our sensitivity, which means if we lower the number, we're increasing the sensitivity. As I misspelled that. So let's now do that for sensitivity for P wave. So if we're trying to sense the P wave, we want to figure out what the threshold is. So if we had an imaginary line and we said we set our threshold at, let's say, 2.5 let's just say it's 2.5 or 3 or whatever you want to say, we have not magically hit the threshold, which is right here. It's right here for the P wave, which in this case, let's say it's 1. 1 is the threshold. So once we turn our dial down and we make it more sensitive, we go from 2.5 to 1.5 on the dial, once we hit, or to 1, I'm sorry, once we hit 1, we've now hit the threshold to where we're finally at the P wave, the top of the P wave. But we know that we want to turn the dial, once we find the threshold, we want to cut it, we want to divide it by two because we want to make it even more sensitive. So one divided by two is 0.5. So we should set the final dial on the machine at about half that. So half would be like, let's say half would be like right here. This will be our final sensitivity setting. So we did what? We went down the number, which means we made it more sensitive. We made it more sensitive so we could pick up this P wave more consistently. So let's say now we're dialed in with our sensitivity to pick up for P waves. So now, how do we know that this, this machine's not gonna pick up and it's not going to get triggered by the R wave. It's not going to get triggered by the T wave. Because look, that threshold is below all those. It's not going to be triggered by whatever these are. I don't know what they were going to try and call these things. But you can see it's probably going to pick up on a bunch of these. It looks like it misses this one. It looks like it hits this one, hits that one. So D, you know, depending on what the setting is, this might not be good, right? Um, so if it's, if it's a P wave, the way that we don't confuse it and let's say, you know, depending on the setting and stuff, is we we end up giving it a general, ref it, we end up telling it that, look, basically, if this is a P wave and not a T wave, then basically we know that within less than, uh, less than zero, oops, less than 0 0.2 seconds, there needs to be a R wave, right? So here's your R wave, and that's a really short, PR intervals. So here we go. This is your P wave. So from here to the start of your R wave is your PR interval. So it should be less than 0.2 seconds. And so if you're able to sense, so if it's like in a dual setting, right, we're able to sense the V and the A, we know that there should be an R wave within whatever we tell it. But in this case, we it should be an R wave within 0.2 seconds. Uh, if there is not an R wave in 0.2 seconds, then it's time for the, because the, we're pacing here, we pace the V and the A, so there's a wire that's going to go into the A, and another wire that's going to go into the V. So we know that, hey, look, the atrium's working. We have a P wave. We gave you enough time for the ventricles and the conduction through the AV node, but for some reason it did not go through. It didn't go through the AV node here. So nothing made it through. And so this pacemaker smart and says, hey, I'm sensing the A. I like the a, I like the P wave there. I know the HRM is doing its job. But hey, look, nothing's coming through. I'm waiting. It's more than 0.2 seconds, which is those, uh, I think it's the five little boxes that we normally measure on the EKG. And it says, all right, well, we need a ventricle contraction right now because Time is of the essence and stuff. And so in that case, it would pace the ventricles to respond in synchrony with the dias with the systole of the atrium, which is filled the ventricles. So that's the that's the ventricle filling. And now the ventricles can contract in synchrony and stuff. Um, again, another scenario would be everything's working fine in the patient. And this person, let's say they have a DDD device of so VNA can be paced, VNA are sense, 
and then in this case if if it's happy with it with what it's sensing it's gonna you know end up doing nothing it's gonna inhibit um, so in that case what happens is that you sent you set the sensitivity to half of what the threshold is, which is in this case, we said threshold is one, and we set it to half, which is one to five by two is 0 0.5. That's our new sensitivity level, which is millivolts, right, for sensitivity. If it was capture or if it was the output side, it'd be in volts. So what happens is it sees the P wave, and then it gets the R wave, and the PR rule is normal, and then it gives you a sort of time this is all programmed we don't typically program these things at all we don't have like a lot of control over this ddd setting and stuff but basically what it does is it says look if everything goes according to plan i am not going to care at all about what happens in here it makes its own refractory period and so it ignores it all because it knows after the R wave, it's going to have repolarization and it knows that there's you need to give time for relative and time for absolute refractory and stuff. And so it gives time for at least the uh, absolute and mostly the relative, depending on the settings and stuff. And then it's going to start to sense again after that time. So we know that, you know, on the X axis is time and it knows that after enough time, it can then start to look for the next P wave. And then if that next P wave is within the threshold, and in this case, this one's, my line's all over the place, but this one didn't meet the threshold and stuff. So this would actually start to have problems with sensitivity and stuff and, and so on. So let's just pretend that this line actually does cross under the next P wave. And it's a weird looking P wave. Let's say it does cross through all these P waves. So it's going to see it, and then it's going to say, okay, well, great, P wave, again, is there an R wave? Yes, there's an R wave. And then it's going to say, yep, cool, going to give you enough time to do your thing. And then I'm going to check out the next one, and so on and so on. And in, in this case, you know, these P waves and T waves are all kind of looking the same. So this whole side of the graph here is kind of, like, not helpful. They should have just kept everything looking the same. But that's generally how the uh, pacemaker is working. So there's all different kinds of external pacemakers. You need to learn the brand and the model that you actually have and, and play around with it. Figure out what happens when I turn it on. What does it go to as a default setting? What happens if I hit that red button at top? What is that going to do? And in a lot of cases, you're going to have emergency modes where you can do asynchronous pacing, which is DOO, VOO, AOO, uh, AO maybe not as common. But either way, you think of OOO and you're going to think of um, just completely clueless, not inhibit it at all. Um, and it's going to just pace away. It's not going to care what the underlying intrinsic rate is. You know, other things you can see on here. So I've identified, or at least this is identified. Okay, here's my power button. Here's my crazy red button. Uh, where do I actually connect things? Um, so ignore this whole do not use thing. I, I think this is like an emergency. You're just going to paste the ventricles. You don't really care about synchronized pacing. But in our settings, we are, and that's why I think this is leave this alone. It's probably because it has a set setting for a certain area that they're used to. Like, hey, we always put in transvenous pacers with this device or this particular model. You know, we use our defibrillators to do the pad pacing. So, you know, they want to keep things simple. People don't get confused. When you turn on, it just, it goes. But in our settings, we are going to have, you know, our leads that are going to come down and it's going to hook up into our atrial and our ventricle. And then we have our red and our black. So they're both going to have them. So we do have to keep that in mind because we'll have epicardial leads. We'll have dual sets and stuff. And we do need to keep that in mind on how to use it, where to connect them, what kind of connectors actually work. What's Can you connect without extensions? Yes, you can. You can have these things on poles, but you don't need the extensions. You can just put this thing around someone's chest and put the leads right into those connectors and stuff uh, without the extensions. Um, and then you can see on here, you know, the other obvious things are you know we can adjust our rate so most likely it's usually 60 to 120 but there is quite a bit of a range on there we can set the current for 
both the um, V and the A here. And I think that we have to change the, and that's most likely, this all depends on what you're, you're touching here, but you can see right here, this is uh, milliamps. And then you can also adjust the, uh, the output too. Uh, so you can adjust the sensitivity, you can adjust the output. It just depends on what setting is available at the time and stuff. Um, and then down here, this is probably your, this is most likely your sensitivities here. And this looks like all your outputs. So the, one of the things I want to show on here is that you'll usually have an area where you can actually see, is it really sensing? So every time it's sensing an intrinsic depolarization, it's going to flash green and recognize that. Every time it's pacing, it's going to flash that it's pacing as well. So we have some common modes that we see most often. In the operating room, the double O modes like VOO and DOO are used when we don't want to care about anything. We don't want to be sensitive to anything. We don't want to do any inhibition. We just want to pace. Pedal to the metal, we're pacing, we could care less what the heart's doing. So there's select times where we're gonna need to do this. And in those cases, it all depends on, you know, where you're most likely boving or quartering and stuff. So anything above the embolicus, you're gonna need to most likely, A, override the ICD so it doesn't shock someone when the person's, you know, let's say they're they're doing the bovine and they think it's a, it makes the machine think it's like BTAC, BFib. They're gonna, sh they're gonna get shocked. So you don't want that to happen because it's not, it's getting confused between the bovine electrical interference and the actual heart rate. So it's not VFib attack. So we want to turn the ICD off. We put a magnet on and we go and we turn it off digitally through the, those stations. Um, the other thing is, is if someone is dependent on their pacemaker, their heart is 100% dependent. Like if that pacemaker stops, their heart stops. They don't beat anymore. Well, you know, the electric bovine could confuse the pacemaker thinking that the person's actually got a nice rhythm because it's meeting all the sensitivity thresholds and it might just not pace. And that person's not gonna have a heart rate, they're gonna have no two plus, the A line's gonna disappear, and then you're gonna be coding the patient. So there are times we need to do the double O stuff, but we call it double O because like double O seven, uh, he's gonna kill you. And if you leave these rates, these settings on, these modes on, then you just forget about it, and then you send them off to like wherever to pack you to the floors and home and stuff. If they're in these settings for a long period, you're increasing their chance that they're gonna pace on a, on a T wave and cause VFib VTAC. It's a nice chart from up to date, general indications, contraindications. Great video on how to insert a transient pacemaker. You should absolutely know how to do this because if you ever had an emergency uh, at work, uh, let's say you're putting in a, I don't know, you're putting in a pulmonary artery catheter and as you're putting a pulmonary artery catheter, the person had a undiagnosed or unrecognized, let's say your left bundle branch block and now you've just caused a right bundle branch block and now they're in complete heart block. So it'd be really helpful to have a pacemaker lead in your use so you could pace them. Okay, so there's definitely some pearls. Uh, always have another battery immediately available. Most of these things are nine volt. Absolutely need to have another battery available. Uh, right ventricle pacing should be avoided if possible. The reason is, is the right ventricle, if you pace the right ventricle, you're going to contribute to a certain degree of ventricular dyssynchrony. Uh, ventricular dyssynchrony is because, well, the heart's usually used to synchronously pacing, right? So typically, for the most part, your SA node fires to your AV node. And then that fires down, it slows a little bit of that connection time, gives time for mechanically for that 
the atriums to passively fill the ventricles, and then also you get the atrial kick, which then really helps push a little bit more blood in. And then after that slow AV conduction, you know, slow is relative, you have the super fast conduction down the Purkinje fibers. And this is relatively synchronized so that all the walls of the hearts are basically, if you had to look at it from a non-anatomical view, you have this left ventricle that's bigger and thicker. Everything contracts in a very mechanized way, right? And you get a really good, efficient cardiac con contraction and cardiac output and stroke blood that comes out. The problem with the pacer lead, so pacer lead being in the right ventricle is, is that it's going to stimulate as it comes down, it's going to stimulate this right side before it stimulates this far left lateral wall. As that all that all that energy starts to dissipate goes in every direction that will that's automatic automaticity has automaticity it can go through all those gap junctions sending off all those electrical signals like the you know speed of lightning but as it works its way over what's actually happening is the right side so this is right left is contracting physically contracting and the septum is physically contracting before this lateral wall contracts. And so we end up getting a less than efficient heart as the right contracts before the left fully contracts. And we, we end up getting a deficiency or a less than efficient heart by 10 to 15%. And you know, for someone who's already in heart failure and only has a, let's say an EF 30%, when you start to drop that EF even lower because we're not efficiently pacing that heart, well, we can make their conditions worse. We sort of talked about sensitivity before, which is figure out where you start to realize, where the machine starts to realize that there's an R wave, if that's what you're shooting for, a P wave. Whatever that number is, that's the threshold, and divide that number by two. And that's what you should set your threshold out uh, in order to be safe. Uh, output or capture, when you're sending out the uh, output part, you should set it about two to three times above the threshold for when you start to see yourself capturing. When you send a pacer spike and you see an R wave after or a P wave after, depending on what you're trying to actually pace, you should set that level about two to three times above that. Okay, so here's a great example of talking about threshold. And so most of the time patients are to come, they're already being paced. So you're just having to determine like if the threshold for pacing is within a safety window or safety margin where you know you're not going to lose capture in the middle of the case. So you should check every day at a minimum, every shift even if you're in two or twelve hour shifts because you know, the the bio impedance, the impedance in general, the resistance can change. So we don't we want to make sure we're in that safety margin. So what you do is you start to turn on the voltage down until you lose capture. And so here you see that they have pretty much no capture at 1.5 as we turn that down. And so it looks like the actual time that you do get capture is about about two. It's probably somewhere a little under two. But so if it is two, we now know that, okay, two's not enough. There's not enough safety margin. If we go, if we get a little bit of resistance, two might turn into the new 1.5, even though the voltage stays the same because there's increased resistance, you'll need more voltage to overcome that to get the right current. And the right current's what's actually causing them to pace. But long story short, uh, if, the, if the impedance and resistance goes up, we wouldn't be capturing. So we want to times it by two, two, three, so our actual output should be four to six. So we have magnets that can be placed on pacemakers, but we don't want to just put a magnet on without knowing what the pacemaker is and what's going to happen with this specific brand and model number when we put a magnet on it. If it's an ICD, typically what happens is, is it disables the tachyarrhythmia so it won't shock the person for any reason. So that's good so there's no interference from what the surgical field's doing, but it's bad if you don't take the magnet off or if it, let's say it throws a switch that we don't know, it doesn't switch back. 
there's an actual physical switch that throws itself when it has a magnet there. Well, what if they go in a VTAC, VFib out in the PACU, and then the, the pacemaker never does what it's supposed to, and there's a delay in treatment, and it's your fault. Uh, so, you know, we should know what we're putting the magnet on and what's going to happen. We shouldn't just assume it's the same one attacker that we should know. For the pacer function, when it comes to, like, hey, let's make sure that the thing paces this 100% dependent person or 60% dependent person on pacement, whatever it is, we don't want the bobe to make the heart think they can take a little vacation for about 20, 30 seconds. So in those cases, a, a magnet will most likely put the pacer into a, you know, a 007 mode, which might be, you know, the VOO or the, um, the DOO. And so it's going to pace the V and A if it's DOO. It's not going to care at all what's happening to either the atrial ventricles. It's going to pace no matter what, and it won't be inhibited. It doesn't care. VO is the same thing. It doesn't care what's being sensed, not sensing a thing, and it's not going to do a thing if it was sensing. So here's actually a scenario with electric cautery going, where the electric cautery is basically interfering with the pacemaker and it's telling it that, hey, look, this person's got a great rhythm. There's nothing for us to do. And as a result, we see that the actual um, pulse that you feel on the wrist is very low. You know, this time span is, if it was, say, six seconds, we'd be able to say that uh, this person is actually has a pulse of 20. You know, it doesn't look like a six-second strip, but we could say that. So we got to be really careful in this setting. We should have... Um, not been in any of these modes. We should have been in a DOO or VOO mode, and we need to immediately intervene and put a magnet on this patient and tell them to stop quartering, doing quartering. So monopolar versus bipolar. Monopolar is going to have a higher risk of having interference. If you're doing surgery above the umbilicus, I think most people still recommend that you should have a have a magnet on or disable the settings like your the settings and what have you uh, ahead of time but if you are going to be using monopolar which is a higher risk for interference at least put the grounding pad somewhere away from where your pacemaker is and so if you're doing a abdominal surgery put it on their like put it on their leg or on their butt or on their on their lower back don't put it up towards the thoracic change where your pacemaker might be or your generator might be so that's number one. Bipolar is uh, going to be much more narrow field where it's it's causing um, burning and stuff because in bipolar, you know, both sides need to have the energy needs to return back to the source. But in the case of bipolar, it's right at the place where they're burning and stuff. So can a bovi cause an R on T phenomenon? Uh, this is just understanding more of the physics behind all this and stuff. And so the answer is actually no. So, you know, people always say, well, you know, it doesn't take a bunch of electricity when the heart's wide open to cause uh, V-fib from R on T syndrome and stuff. But uh, that is not the case. So the reason why the pacemaker might cause it is because it's on a, sim on a lower cycle or hertz, which is similar to the heart. But the bovi is on such a fast hertz or cycles per second that it's impossible for it to actually, for the heart to even have a chance to respond to it. So the, the heart's typically about like one or two hertz. And, and one hertz is basically, if I wrote it out, like one hertz, hertz is equal to um, one cycle per um, second. One cycle per second. So the heart, which is one or two hertz, is about 60 to 100 beats per minute. Or again, one hertz is one cycle per second. There's 60 seconds in a minute. Therefore, there's 60 cycles in a minute. And so a heart at one hertz is 60 to 120. And the uh, the quartery, on the other hand, is I think it's about a million hertz. So you know you, you look at the quartery right here, and you're thinking about one million hertz i mean these numbers are insanely different from 1 million to 1 hertz and so the heart is not going to be affected by it because the frequency is too high so we've been talking so much about um, the rnt syndrome or phenomenon so here we are we're in a voodoo setting and the intrinsic heart is also doing its own thing and so we end up having like two competing pacemakers the natural heart and then this uh pacemaker 
Now you can see here's a spike and then we have what appears to be a spike on the relative or the absolute refractory period. So here's your T wave. Your T wave starts right here, ends right here. And so the spike goes right in the middle of the T wave and stuff. And during a time that's not supposed to, supposed to go. And so as a result, what we see is we see the person go into an arrhythmia, tachyarrhythmia that is then, guess what, shockable. Um, so it's funny that a shocking part of the defibr of the machine causes an arrhythmia that then needs to be shocked again. Um, and then that's the problem. So we have a third degree heart block. So pretty much this person's pacemaker mostly dependent. You know, if it's intrinsic V rate is in 20 to 40, which is what you would typically think, although it could be accelerated sometimes. So this person's ventricles can be a little slow. The cardiac puts them a little low. We know this person needs a pacemaker. The problem is this one takes the drapes off and pulls out the ventricle lead, let's say. Now, remember, there's two leads. There's going to be, you know, your 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 positive and then your your negative so they pull out one of these leads what can you do you it's great you can you can you know you can paste the atrial wires but the atrial wires are going to help you when you don't have a you don't have an av node for them to conduct through so what you need is is you need um a way to still use that last lead so let's say that this person's um ground lead was taken out well, what you can do is, is you can now use the ground lead off of the atrial wires to make your to make your connection. And then back, I guess it would say, it would go back to here. So you'd have this one going here, going to there, and you'd make your connection. And then you could actually still pace the person. The other thing you can do is you can put a lead into the skin and go from heart to skin, or from skin to heart, and then back to the... Um, back to the machine and stuff. And that's another viable way and stuff. As long as you have a way home, electrons will move. They just have to have a place to go and a place to come back. Okay, so let's read this together. And basically this is another type of pacer. Uh, so you have here, you have your your sensitivity for saying, hey, what, what what's going on? And then you have, okay, well, what are we gonna do? We're gonna pace what? And then here's your, your rates per minute. And then this is your mode. Um, so if we did things based on the first, second, and third column, uh, what are we pacing? In this case, uh, it appears we're pacing nothing because right here it shows that we're off. But we have really only two modes in this machine. So we have a VVI with a beep, which I'm not sure what that is. So it looks like we have VVI. Uh, so we're going to do VVI. So we're going to pace the V. And we're going to sense the um, we're going to sense the ventricle. So now on our sensing side, let's go over here. We're sensing uh, about two, so this is two millivolts. And then what are we going to do if we uh, don't sense a ventricle beat, um, or if we sense a ventricle beat? What are we going to do? We're going to uh, it looks like we're going to inhibit. So if we sense a ventricle beat, we're going to do nothing because we don't need to because it's it's pumping, it's it's sending electrical pulse, it's working. Now if we don't sense a ventricle R wave, we're going to pace. What are we going to pace? We're going to pace with the output. We're going to pace, which is uh, right here, uh, six volts now let's say we wanted to turn this machine into a 007 type of uh, rate or mode we want a voo mode because we're gonna go to the or but this pacemaker only has unfortunately a vvi mode so the trick here is to and we don't have uh, any type of O at all for the, you know, the, what does the machine do? So what we do is, is we can uh, do one of a couple of things, but probably the easiest thing to do is either, well, the two things you can do is, is this, you can make it so that your output is really low and it won't do anything, but you know, it's still sending some type of electrical impulse. So this is probably not the best thing. 
But what you can do is you can turn this dial all the way to 20. And what that's going to do is, is if it's only sensing the R wave, so let's draw our chart. So we effectively, or first of all, let's just say that our threshold, if we're going to learn again, our threshold is basically right here at two. We know we have to set the actual output to two to three times that. So that should be, our output should always, should be in this case, four to six, and it's set at six right now. So it's all set up right. But what we're, what we're going to do is, is we're going to now be looking at the sensitivity. Uh, so let's redraw this with sensitivity in mind. So when it comes to sensitivity, our threshold for sensitivity here is four. We know we want to divide four by two, so we have a little bit of comfort. We have a little bit of room for comfort. So our actual sensitivity is going to be two. So our real sensit our actual sensitivity is going to be right here, and we'll draw that across, which is exactly where it's at right now. But if we were to raise that sensitivity above our threshold and you know we just said or what our threshold was which is four it was right here but if we were to raise the roof here and go way up on our sensitivity and we were to go to 20 our sensitivity would be way up here and we would never ever get close to our threshold which is the point at which we start to sense the in this case the r wave so we could have the, the pacemaker on the whole time, but it's never going to pace the patient because it's never going to uh, sense this person's um, uh, heart. And if it doesn't sense in this mode VVI, if it doesn't sense V, what's it going to do? It's going to pace V. It's time to pace. That's all it's there for. It's only going to pace. That's the whole job of this thing is to pace. So if it doesn't think it's doing its R wave, it's going to pace and make an R wave. So in this case, you've now just started a uh, your own magical VV or VOO uh, setting. All right, let's do a couple of practice problems. So I'm looking at this. I pace. I have an R wave. I pace. I have an R wave. I pace. Nothing happens. I then have a intrinsic beat that's got a P wave QRS. The other ones were just, you know, ventricle pacing. And then all of a sudden, my pacer says I'm going to pace. Nothing happens. And I'm going to pace. And I got like, I don't even know what this is called. Like, this is, is that synchronous? Uh, it probably isn't because it looks like we have a. It looks like every other pacemaker was a, you know, a, it's a V pacer. This looks like sort of like a P wave here. So I would say I'm pacing, but there's also an intrinsic beat again here, intrinsic beat here. So I'm a little asynchronous and stuff. So so what's wrong here? Um, it's not matching up great and stuff. Like, you know, depending on where we're sensing we're pacing, we're not picking up that we're having a beat, which should then inhibit the pacemaker for a little bit. It should have inhibited this, but did inhibit this. Um, so intrinsic, intrinsic, intrinsic should have inhibited the pacemaker at this point. If you start getting nicer, you know, natural beats, but did it do that? So there's a couple of causes for that. And then we have some lists on here on what to do. So on this one, it looks like we are trying to pace consistently. And in this case, it's not sensing. So for some reason, we're, we're not sensing. It's a failure to sense. One of the biggest concerns when I'm looking at this right now is that you've got a pacer spike right on a T wave. So it should have seen this, you know, depending on what it, if it's sensing this, you, we don't know what the pacemaker setting is and stuff, which is fine because try to keep it simple. But it should have sensed the P wave, at least should have sensed the P wave or should have sensed the R wave. And then it should have just completely inhibited the pacemaker and said, nope, don't do anything. Stop this, right? And then it probably would have waited again a little while, a certain amount of time. And if it didn't sense anything, then it would pace again. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully this helps you in the clinical setting.
leave comments if you have any questions about base makers.